Checking in with CNBC's Tyler Matheson, up next on Carpe Diem. Hello and welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Merrill Brown, Director of the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. Joining me today is CNBC anchor and Vice President of Strategic Editorial Initiatives, Tyler Matheson. As Vice President for Strategic Editorial Initiatives, Tyler works closely with CNBC's business development and marketing teams on strategic initiatives and alliances. He also co-anchors CNBC's Power Lunch and Nightly Business Report, an award-winning business news program that reaches about 96% of U.S. households through public television. Purchased in early 2013 by CNBC, Nightly Business Report is the first program produced by a cable network for public television. The program features in-depth coverage and analysis of the biggest financial news stories of the day, as well as connecting the public to the world's top business leaders. Tyler, thanks for joining me. Good to be with you, Merrill. Thank you, Tyler. It's great to have one of America's great business journalists <laughs> at Montclair State <laughs> University today. Thank well, you for thank coming. Well, thank you for having me. It's a good time for business news in it many is. ways. It's a tough time for the country in many ways, but tough times are often good times for business news. Tell us how you approach the complexity of continuing resolutions, its impact on our daily financial lives, and all that the current circumstance yields. Well, there are times when politics and business intersect, and certainly uh, this past fall has been one of those times as, as the country faced yet another uh, uh, government shutdown, uh, not the first one we've had. I think we've had something like 17 uh, in all over the past uh, several decades. Uh, and once again, a, a, a political dispute over whether uh, the uh, nation's debt ceiling should be raised. And these things, obviously, affect the economy and business and public confidence and investor confidence. And so when you get those, that kind of confluence of political events uh, and business events that can move the markets very violently up or down based on this hour's headline or the next comment from Senator McConnell or this word from the uh, White House press secretary, uh, you have a very volatile environment, uh, one with a lot of action that can be very fast moving. Uh, and on CNBC, the cable network, we, we cover those events in real time as they happen. Uh, on Nightly Business Report for PBS, a program that we put together at the end of the day, uh, we try and be as up to date as we can. Things happen at 5 o'clock, 5.30, right as we're going to tape, uh, and you try and get them in, but we are able to step back and try and put some of those day's events into a broader context. Um, you've been at this for a while. Is this current period as um, enthralling, captivating, dangerous as any in the periods of tumult you've covered? No, I wouldn't say so. I, I think uh, the most captivating period was the 2007, 2008, 2009 period, where the financial system uh, and the global economy came as close to unhinging uh, as at any time in my 31 years in financial journalism. Um, uh, I began uh, as a magazine writer, as, as you know, at Time Incorporated for a magazine called Money Magazine. Uh, and I began in the uh, summer of 1982, a time when the U.S. economy was in uh, a real intractable uh, recession. It was the only double-dip recession this country has had in my lifetime. If you go back to uh, the, the Great Depression, obviously it had uh, a, a more serious uh, dip. But 2007, the housing boom and bust. 2008, the uh, bankruptcies of, uh, of Bear Stearns, uh, basically the, uh, the conservatorship of AIG, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the bankruptcy uh, of Lehman Brothers, uh, the, the near bankruptcy of, and I don't think this is uh, overly stating it, of Merrill Lynch. It had to be taken over by, uh, uh, by, another, by Bank of America. So, all of those things, that was the most riveting, dangerous, compelling time. Not to minimize 
um, uh, the, the recent events with the government closure and the, and the debt ceiling debate. But that was where the system came as close to go, getting unhinged as I can ever remember it. Among our many common interests... It was simply frightening, to be honest to, with you. To all of us, no doubt. Um, one of our many pieces of common ground is that we both grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. Mm -hmm. We both came up through families that were uh, federal employees. We grew up with great respect for public service mm -hmm. and what federal employment meant. You've had some very critical things to say about the kind of men and women who are our legislators these mm -hmm. days. Share with us that worldview. Well, uh, it pains me uh, to hear uh, politicians uh, make a piñata out of Washington, out of federal service, uh, out of public service, uh, and they do it for political points. One of the great ironies to me uh, is you hear uh, many politicians on either side of the aisle uh, criticize Washington and say how evil and bad and destructive and uh, retarding to the, to the economy Washington is. But you know what? All of those sons of a gun, when they decide to leave politics, where do they live? K Street. K Street. They live in Washington. They can't imagine not living in Washington. Why? Because there's money there, because there's a sense of importance there. And that really, as you can tell right now, that makes me animated, mm. let's say. Uh, when I also see uh, politicians as in this fall's episode over the closing of the government and and uh, uh, dithering over the debt ceiling, uh, m making political points with something that is central to the functioning of this economy and the global economy, like the debt ceiling. Uh, when I see politicians doing things for political gain, which is what they're all about. They call it politics. They call it politics. That's why they call it politics. When I see th them doing that, and I see that putting at risk the 401ks and the savings and the hard-earned money of individuals in this country, that makes me angry. Uh, and, and I just don't like that. So, so I do have strong things to say. And as you can tell, I have strong feelings about that. I, I think there's a great cynicism uh, in the political class. Uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of grandstanding in the political class. I believe, with respect to the debt ceiling, that if sanctimony and hypocrisy were currency in Washington, we wouldn't have any debates about the debt ceiling. There would be plenty of money to go around. As we come out of this period of tumult in Washington and hopefully hopefully move into a Was period I clear of, enough on that? You were quite clear, thank you. <laughs> As we move into a period of hopefully calmer public policy moving into the new year, what do you think about the larger economic situation? Well, I think the American economy uh, is in a reasonable uh, position right now. Uh, if uh, the politicians don't uh, um, stymie it, uh, I think it, it, moving from one continuing resolution that funds the government for three months or six months to another is no way to run a government. I think running from one debt ceiling raise uh, that keeps uh, the debt uh, moving and paying our past uh, obligations for six weeks at a time is no way to do business, and I think that retards uh, uh, the overall U.S. economy. I think the tax system needs to be fixed. I think it retards the U.S. economy. But all that set aside, uh, the U.S. economy, I think, is in a pretty good place with low growth and low inflation. There's going to be a new Federal Reserve chief who will come in, presumably be uh, uh, confirmed by Congress and take over sometime uh, early next year. Uh, she, Ms. Yellen, will probably continue the the general policies of Mr. Bernanke, which has put a premium on economic growth and keeping unemployment low. Uh, there has not been much inflation. So I think overall uh, the U.S. economy is in a reasonably good place. We've begun to see uh, some manufacturing return to the U.S., uh, manufacturing that had been done overseas, China, Southeast Asia, toy manufacturing, textile manu uh, manufacturing, even electronics manufacturing. So I, I, think, we're, I think we're okay. Uh, I don't think this is a time where there's going to be rapid growth. Uh, I think if the tax system were better, we might have better growth. Um, I think we're probably in an economy where there are, where the unemployment rate is unlikely to be 4% or 5%. And, 
and where the underemployment rate is likely to be higher. By that I mean there are going to be a lot of people uh, who are not going to be able to get the full-time jobs that they want. They're going to be a lot more sort of part-timers, freelancers, contract workers. Uh, and where a lot of educated, uh, capable individuals are going to be underemployed, i.e., that is, they're going to be working in jobs beneath their level of education. Uh, they're going to have to accept jobs that are lower paying and in service, service fields. Uh, food service, hospitality, whatever, nothing against that, uh, but, but maybe not the jobs that they thought uh, they were preparing for. But that raises the critical issue of inequality, yes. which is the great critique of the American economy these days, mm -hmm. and you articulated a point of view about the economy that is fairly mainstream and fairly Wall, Wall Street centric. Mm -hmm. You work uh, beside Wall Street mm -hmm. and very close to it in many ways. What about the inequality critique? Well, I think that that, that that I don't think the the country in my lifetime has seen the level of split that we have right now, uh, and I think that's long term a deeply troubling thing. That is, those are the the foundations on which real revolutionary change gets built uh, over time. I, I think the tax system uh, has exacerbated that inequality. Um, I have no problem, by the way, uh, I'm a lucky guy, I have a nice income, uh, uh, I have a two-income household, uh, I'm a very fortunate person. I do not mind paying tax, I don't mind paying a little more tax. I almost view that as, as uh, the price of success in a way. I also, but, but at the same time, I believe everybody should pay a little tax, everybody. And I realize that everybody does in the form of sales taxes. Many people do in the form of, uh, in, in the form of uh, other taxes and fees, such as real estate taxes. But I believe that any U.S. citizen ought to pay, unless they are truly below the poverty line, ought to pay something to, to, to make the government work. And I don't see that. So I think the system needs to be made more fair. I think it is a very difficult, and I don't pretend to have a, problem, a, a solution to, to the question of economic inequality in this country. I really don't, I really don't know how to get at that. Um, but I think the tax system can help. Uh, uh, but, I, but I think fairness is that the wealthy probably need to pay more and can. But I also believe that everybody ought to pay something and a lot of people don't. Let's move on to CNBC in the state of uh, your business, the mm -hmm. one that you have uh, both on air and strategic responsibilities mm -hmm. for. Very exciting that CNBC is now in public television, but unnerving to some number of public television viewers you think? when they saw that coming. I think yeah. there mm -hmm. was a bit of a flap around the acquisition yep. when you bought it uh, yep. earlier this year. How has that all worked out, and what's it like for Tyler Matheson to be on public television? Well, I hope it's worked out well, because what we did, uh, the Property Nightly Business Report, which was a long-standing 30-some-odd years uh, uh, as uh, the sort of the flagship business program on public television, uh, it had been uh, launched and produced by the uh, public television station in South Florida, WPBT. Uh, and in recent years, uh, they had the finances of public television are very are challenged, frankly, these days. Uh, and they had uh, found WPBT that it was uh, becoming more and more difficult for them to underwrite uh, the cost uh, of producing the program, to find underwriters and sponsors who were willing to pay. Uh, large dollar amounts to help defray those expenses. And those problems, we talked just a minute ago about the, the financial crisis of 2007, 8, 9, that's when it really came home because companies were pulling back. They weren't writing the big sponsorship uh, or underwriting checks to, to, to cover uh, public television enterprises like Nightly Business Report. And, and so that program, it, it really became a question of, uh, are you going to fold it? Or are you going to find someone who is willing to take it over uh, and produce it and potentially uh, find some sponsorship or underwriting dollars for it? Uh, and when push came to shove, uh, WPBT, the, the sponsoring station of it, and the, uh, the private producer that had taken over production of it, uh, uh, concluded that, that CNBC was the best choice to take it over. Uh, 
I don't know the details of the deal and where money's changed hands and, and who's getting paid what. But what I do know is uh, that fundamentally we have tried at CNBC to continue to produce a program for the public television audience that is consistent with, remains true to, uh, the sensibilities, the standards, the approach uh, that Nightly Business Report had uh, when it was produced under the public television umbrella. Uh, yes, we use CNBC on-air talent. Yes, we use uh, the auspices and the reach of CNBC, which is much which is one of the really great advantages that CNBC brings to Nightly Business Report is that we have people all over the globe, all over the country. We have facilities and infrastructure that, that the public television world, uh, the WPBT and, and their subsequent producers, could not hope to, to duplicate. So, so we're able to, I think, produce a richer program. Now, the, the public television audience <laughs> If, if you were to say, what is the opposite of public television? You would say cable television. Mm. Cable and public TV are strange bedfellows, frankly. Um, because we're commercial. We want to make money. Uh, not that public television doesn't want to make money. They just don't want to make profit. But they want to, they want to be... They want sustainability. They want course. sustainability. Um, uh, and so I think there are a lot of people in the the institutional world of public television and in the audience of public television who were suspicious and probably remain suspicious that CNBC, uh, a cable television uh, company uh, owned by NBC Universal, uh, uh, was going to remain true to their product and that we would be too show busy and too political and too uh, into uh, contentious debate. And I, I've seen those criticisms. I don't, I don't think that if you stacked today's nightly business report against the nightly business report that was being produced a year ago, that you would be able to tell a great deal of difference. The look is a little different. The pace is a little different. The story count is higher. Uh, maybe there is some more production polish that we bring, bring in, but sometimes I look at packages we do and I go, man, that's not up to the, up to the old standard, frankly. But so that, that's, that's where we are. And I think it's been a success. I think we will probably, uh, uh, we will probably partner in other uh, areas with public television producers. Uh, we've had some discussions uh, with respect to a weekly business politics show uh, with, uh, with public television people. And uh, I'm hopeful on that. I, I you don't want to get ahead of my management there, I mean, I'm part of the management, but I don't want to get ahead of that, but, but I, there, there are conversations going on, and I think that, that the early returns on CNBC's stewardship of Nightly Business Report are, for the most part, positive. How about uh, ratings? Ratings actually are a little bit higher uh, in the uh, key demographic. Um, uh, they're a little higher than they were year over year, not by a, by a ton. Uh, but what, what is the key demographic? The key demographic is, is 25 to 54 adults. And there are six or seven of them watching. There are six or seven <laughs> of them watching, that's right. At, at our households, uh, which I believe is in the roughly 400,000 household uh, average range, uh, are relatively stable year on year. Uh, our demographics uh, have been up like 10, 15 percent. Uh, that's very positive in a world where business news viewership is trending down. It's trending down on cable television uh, for CNBC uh, for a variety of reasons. One is fatigue and cynicism about the ability to make money in the marketplace. Uh, one is the idea that the story is tired. There's viewer fatigue. Uh, and the other is the competition uh, from handheld devices and iPads and so forth. You can get your business news in lots of instant, immediate ways uh, via digital devices that you, that you couldn't have six, eight years ago or that people weren't as familiar with. And what's in it for CNBC? What has CNBC gained from having a uh, face on public television? I think cross-pollination. I think you, you, we like their audience. 
It is a sizable audience. In fact, the Nightly Business Report audience on any given night, on average, exceeds the average audience of any other day part program on CNBC. Higher households, higher, higher numbers, sheer numbers, because broadcast television and, and public television is still very large. It reaches a, a big, influential, educated, and generally affluent audience. Uh, so, you're reach, with some branding, you're reaching, reaching the, uh, the, with some CNBC branding, I should say, you're reaching an, a desirable audience, that's number one. Number two, you hope that some of the viewers that are watching on NBR will migrate over to CNBC or CNBC's websites um, uh, or the NBR website. We hope and have been able to sell some uh, underwriting arrangements with Viking River Cruises and the street.com and we hope to sell more of those. It feels like we ought to be able to do that uh, and that can can offset cost. Um, and so uh, that's what we see in it. I mean, is it going to be a program that will, that will really move the bottom line of CNBC? I don't think so. Uh, but do I see cross-pollination and, and, quote, synergies? Uh, yes, I do. And do you find yourself putting on a new hat when you move from your daytime lunch anchoring to your evening public television anchoring on an entirely different platform? It's a good question because I think for me, I do come at the public television program with a different sensibility. I think, and it is also that at the end of the day, as I mentioned a moment ago, you step back and you, you are choosier about the stories you're going to include. When you're when you're broadcasting 14 hours of live television a day, you can throw pretty much everything in at one time or not. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, we need the content. We need to put that in. There's more filler. There's more hamburger helper uh, uh, during the, the live real-time broadcast day. On a 26-minute PBS pro, uh, public television uh, program, you have to be choosier. That's number one. Number two, I think the sensibility of the public television audience is... Uh, more straightforward, sober, uh, than it, less playful. Uh, they've come to expect a certain kind of broadcast, and we try and do that. On CNBC during the day, it's live, it's moving, it's going from this live event to that, it's covering the markets in real time. There's a, there's a, there's a chattiness, a friendliness, uh, an, uh, an unscriptedness. Uh, that uh, distinguishes CNBC's product from what I do at, 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 in the evening. And also a certain attitude, sometimes yes, yes. funny, sometimes snarky, sometimes, you know, in, intense as things happen mm -hmm. around you. That doesn't get conveyed into Nightly Business Report, right? No, I, generally not. Uh, and in fact, I, I have been uh, reminded of that when sometimes... Uh, my improvisational and feeble attempts at humor have maybe not been perceived as, as particularly funny on, 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 the, on the public television program or on, on CNBC for that matter. I think we also, on, on Nightly Business Report, we are a little more mindful uh, and sensitive to uh, the idea that, that, that Nightly Business Report's reason for being is to cover business, the economy, and the markets, not politics. Uh, on CNBC, cable is about niche and heat, okay? Put the two together. You've got your niche and you want heat. So we will have more political and uh, debate, confrontation on CNBC than we'll ever have on Nightly Business Report. Speaking of heat, mm. uh, there was a body of thought uh, some time ago, I guess two years ago, that you were going to get a lot of heat from Fox Business. Mm -hmm. You were in a somewhat monopolistic position for mm -hmm. a while, CNBC mm -hmm. being dominant in cable business news. Now there's Fox Business. Mm -hmm. You feel footsteps? No, not really. Not at all. Um, I think we are still far and away uh, the brand associated with, um, with, with credible, accurate, fast and unbiased business news coverage. Uh, that's not to say that Fox doesn't put out a good product and that we don't watch what they do. Uh, I think Fox does, uh, and, and Fox News and Fox Business News uh, do a very good job 
in framing stories for their audience. Uh, Fox Business uh, has benefited from uh, the affiliation with Fox and the, and the branding that Fox has uh, as, a, as a news provider. Uh, so they have been able to build uh, an audience. Uh, their audience is still a fraction of our audience. At first it was a fraction in part because their carriage was not so great on cable systems. Uh, now their carriage is roughly comparable to ours, a little smaller. Uh, but they're, they're, and, and they have partly closed the gap in audience. Uh, but, but I think of Fox uh, Business as kind of the ESPN2 of, of the Fox News operation. So there's ESPN and ESPN2. I think Fox Business is uh, the Fox 2, Fox News 2, uh, to Big Fox. Uh, uh, are, are you ever sitting around the office and watching them and saying, boy, I wish we had that story today, or how'd they beat us on this? Does it sometimes, ever come up in the dialogue? Uh, sometimes it does. I mean, we are competitive. We want to, uh, I think we spend more time covering the markets and, and business, and they spend a little more time uh, covering the political dimension of things. I'll tell you the competitor that I watch for business competition more closely, and that is Bloomberg. Uh, Bloomberg has a serious... They are all about business. They have a serious, serious news gathering operation. 5,000 people. They are a private company, so they are willing to spend and invest. They have put a lot of money into their television product. Uh, they have styled it up. They've got uh, smart, good-looking uh, people. And so they, they're the one I watch for business news competition more closely. Nobody ever went wrong keeping an eye on anything named Bloomberg. So no. that's, that's a wise idea. Yeah. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks for being with Meryl, us. Meryl, thanks very much. If you would like more information about Tyler Matheson or about any other Carpe Diem, you can write to us at the email address on your screen, carpediem at mail.montclair.edu, or call us at 973-655-5158. For Carpe Diem, I'm Meryl Brown. Thanks for watching.